Bibles, if you would, to, he, to Hosea uh, chapter 4, verse 1, and then chapter 11, verses 7 to 9. We're going to put these on the, on the screens for you so you can see them. Uh, Hosea is the story of God's steadfast love for his people. One of the words for love or mercy in the Old Testament I found this fascinating. It's the word in the Hebrew that, that goes down to the root of the word for womb, W-O-M-B, womb. And one of the words God uses to describe how he, how he cares for us is that word. Uh, and, and you think about it, that all things being equal, there's not a more safe, nurturing place in the world than the womb of a woman. So we're going to study about this tonight, and I just want you to stand with me and follow along as I read. You can follow along on the screen if you, if you need to. Hosea, chapter 4, verse 1, chapter 11, verses 7 to 9. Hear the word of the Lord, O children of Israel, for the Lord has a controversy with the inhabitants of the land. There's no faithfulness or steadfast love, no knowledge of God in the land. And then down in chapter 11, my people are bent on turning away from me. And though they call out to the Most High, he shall not raise them up at all. How can I give you up, O Ephraim? How can I hand you over, O Israel? How can I make you like Adma? How can I treat you like Zeboim? My heart recoils within me. My compassion grows warm and tender. I will not execute my burning anger. I will not again destroy Ephraim. For I am God and not a man, the Holy One in your midst, and I will not come in wrath. Clear indication is that he could justly do that. He probably should do that. But his compassion, his compassion uh, overreaches, in this case, uh, his, his sense of the need to punish his people for turning their backs on him. We just read together what? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. And may we be taught tonight about, oh, how He loves you. Oh, how He loves me. And respond to that appropriately. Thank you. Please be seated. would remind you that the theme passage for this study is John chapter 5, verses 39 and 40 where Jesus said to the religious leaders, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. Now think about that. What he has said is true, but it's not true for the way they're approaching it. They think that simply by, by mastering the scriptures that they gain eternal life. And he goes on and tells them how they're missing it. And it is they that bear witness about me. Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. Very similar complaint God made to the people in Hosea's day. Let's watch this brief video on the book of Hosea. The book, the book of the, of the prophet, prophet Hosea. Hosea, Hosea lived, lived in the northern, northern kingdom, kingdom of Israel, Israel which, which he sometimes calls Ephraim, Ephraim or Jacob, about 200, 200 years after they had, they had broken, off from, had broken off from southern Judah. Judah. Remember, Remember the story, the story from 1 Kings. Kings. Hosea, Hosea was, called was called to speak on God's, God's behalf during the reign of one of Israel's worst kings, kings Jeroboam, Jeroboam II. II. The nation the was descending into chaos, and in the year 722, the big bad Assyrian Empire swooped in and decimated Israel. Again, see the story in 2 Kings. And Hosea had seen all, all of this, of this coming. coming. The book, the book is a book collection, is a collection of, of some 25, 25 years of his preaching and writing. It's, it's almost, almost all poetry. poetry. And this and whole this collection has been designed, designed to have three main sections. sections. Let's, Let's just, just dive, dive in and you'll, you'll see how, see how it, works. it works. The opening part, part tells the story of Hosea's broken, broken marriage to a woman, woman named Gomer, Gomer who, who commits, commits adultery. adultery. 
Now, it's not totally clear whether Gomer slept around with other men before or only after they got married, but they did have three children together and things fell apart. The important point is that God tells Hosea that despite Gomer's unfaithfulness, he is to go find her, to pay off her debts to her lovers, and to commit his love and faithfulness to her once again. And then God says that all of this, the broken and repaired marriage, the children, it's all a prophetic symbol telling the story of God's relationship to Israel. So God, so God has been, been like a faithful like a husband, husband to Israel. Israel. He, he rescued, rescued them out of slavery. He brought them to Mount Sinai, Sinai where, he where he entered into a covenant, covenant with them. He asked, he asked them, them to be faithful, faithful to him alone. But then, but then he, brought he brought Israel into the promised land, land and they, and they took, took all the abundance that he gave them, them and they dedicated it to the worship of the Canaanite god Baal. And so God has a legitimate reason. He could end the covenant and divorce Israel and he thinks about doing so but instead he says that he's going to pursue Israel again and and renew his, his covenant, covenant with them. And he and says, he says why? why? It's purely, it's purely because, because of his own love, love compassion, compassion, and faithfulness. And faithfulness. Hosea, Hosea then spells, spells out what all this means. means. He, says, he the says the consequences for Israel's rebellion will be will imminent defeat by other nations and exile. exile. But, there's but there's hope for future restoration. restoration. One, One day Israel, Israel will once, once again repent and come back to worship their God. And Hosea says, he will place over them a new messianic king from the line of David who will bring God's blessing. And so, and so this, this opening, opening section introduces, introduces all the main ideas of the book. Of the book. Israel, Israel has, has rebelled. rebelled. And God's, and God's going, going to bring, bring severe consequences, consequences but, but God's, God's own covenant, covenant love and mercy are more, more powerful than Israel's, Israel's sin. sin. And so, and so in, the in the remaining sections of the book, of the book Hosea's, Hosea's poetry explores these themes in more depth. depth. So, so there are two collections of his accusations and warnings for Israel, and then each of these is concluded by a very hopeful poem about God's mercy and hope for the future. So chapter 4 through 10. Hosea, Hosea explores, explores the causes, causes and, effects and effects of Israel's unfaithfulness. He, he says numerous times that Israel lacks all knowledge or understanding of God. God. The, Hebrew the Hebrew word to know, know which is yada, yada, it's more, it's more than, than just intellectual, intellectual activity. activity. It, it describes personal, personal relational knowledge. knowledge. It's, the it's the difference between just, just knowing, knowing about, about someone and then, and then actually knowing that, that someone. someone. And, God and God wants Israel to know him like that in a relationship. He wants them to experience his love love for them, them and, become and become the kind the of kind knowledge, knowledge that transforms, transforms their, hearts their hearts and lives so that, so they, that they love him in return. In return. And so this, so is, this why is why Hosea is constantly, constantly exposing the hypocrisy of Israel's, Israel's worship. worship. He constantly, he constantly shows, shows how they're breaking, how they're breaking the Ten, Ten Commandments, Commandments, how they're how allowing, allowing grave, grave injustice in their communities, and then, and then they, go they go to their sacred temples and they offer sacrifices to God like everything is just fine. But it's not fine. And not only because of their hypocrisy, but because they're worshiping all of these other gods too. He, he, mentions he mentions many, many times, times their altars to Baal, to Baal at the cities, the cities of Bethel and Gilgal. And not, and not only, only have they, have they given they their allegiance to the gods, God. Hosea repeatedly, repeatedly accuses Israel for trusting, trusting in their political alliances with Egypt, with Egypt and Assyria. And Assyria. So, instead so instead of trusting, trusting God, God to protect them, them they, want they want to become, become like these nations, nations and rely solely on military power. And God says it's all going to come crashing down on their heads. Because in not too long, Assyria will turn on them and come to ravage their their lands. Their lands. In this, in this other, other section, section of warning, of warning Hosea, Hosea gives an ancient, ancient Israelite, Israelite history, history lesson, lesson to, show to show how this how family has been unfaithful from, from the beginning. beginning. So, he, so alludes he alludes to the patriarch Jacob's lying and treachery. Remember, Remember Genesis, Genesis 27, 27 and 28. Yeah, yeah. He, alludes he alludes to Israel's rebellion in the wilderness. In the wilderness. Remember, Remember the book of Numbers. Numbers. He alludes to their the appointment of the corrupt king Saul who led the people into sin and disaster. Remember the stories in 1 Samuel. This is all Hosea's way of saying some things in this family family never change. So what hope does Hosea have? Well, we know from chapter 3 that God's going to do something to save and restore his people. And that's what these two concluding chapters explore. Chapter 11 is beautiful. The poem depicts God as a loving father who raised his son Israel and then shared everything with him. But the son grew up and rebelled and turned on the father, taking advantage of his generosity. And so in this poem, God is emotionally torn apart. One moment he's angry, and naturally he says he's going to bring severe consequences. But the next moment he's heartbroken. And then he says that he's moved by his mercy and compassion, and he's going to forgive 
forgive the son that he loves. He says, how can I give you up, Ephraim? My heart churns inside of me. All my compassion is aroused. And so while God did allow Israel to be conquered by Assyria, face the consequences, that's not God's final word. There's still hope. And that's what the last chapter is about. Hosea calls Israel to repent and turn back to their God, but he knows that it won't last because it never has before. And God says that one day he will heal their waywardness and love them freely. God goes on to describe this new healed Israel as a lush tree that will grow deep roots and broad branches and offer shade and fruit to all of the nations. It's an image of God's promise to Abraham, how Israel was to become a blessing to the nations. And God saying, if that's ever going to happen, it's going to require an act of God's grace and healing power to repair the deep brokenness and sinful selfishness of the human heart so that God's people can receive his love and love him in return. This is what God promises to do. Now, after this poem concludes, we find the very last words of the book. They're like an appended note. They're likely from the author who collected Hosea's poetry and now wants to speak to you, the reader, for a second. And he says, who is wise and discerning to understand all of this? In other words, Hosea's poems. The ways of the Lord are right. The righteous walk in them, but the rebellious stumble in them. So the author wants you to know that Hosea's ancient poetry to northern Israel is not locked in the past. It reveals deep truths about God's character and purposes and human nature. And while God should and does bring his justice on human evil, his ultimate purpose, his heart, is to heal and to save his people. And that's what the book of Hosea is all about. Another excellent video summary of the book of the prophet Hosea. Do a little background uh, introduction of a survey of it real quickly. Um, He's called by God to prophesy to Israel, the northern kingdom, uh, in what's been called Israel's last days, very much uh, like Jeremiah would be called later to prophesy to Judah when it was coming apart and about to experience its last days. Um, He experiences a personal tragedy which becomes the object lesson of the coming national tragedy uh, between God and Israel. He is a faithful lover uh, married to a woman who is unfaithful to him. And we'll deal with this at the end of the the study, but uh, it's not quite sure whether, since Hosea wrote this, is he saying, God came to him and said, I want you to go marry the harlot Gomer. Or did God say, go marry Gomer? And in marrying Gomer, she became a harlot. And so when when Hosea's writing this, he's writing looking back on it. And the the very capable scholars disagree as to what, uh, what he heard whether he's editorializing or or not. So it's a a very great uh, tragedy between him and his faithless wife. But it represents throughout the book Jehovah, the covenant God, and his faithless people. But God teaches him and shows for us what unconditional love looks like. It keeps seeking, even when it's spurned. It means buying back his wife from the slave market. For Israel, the lesson is a purifying punishment and then being restored to the land of promise. So Hosea is set in the northern kingdom, uh, 755 to 710 B.C. You'll remember in our, in our previous studies about 722 that That's when uh, Assyria sacked uh, the northern kingdom. It's broken down, as you saw in the video, in two sections, an adulterous wife and a faithful husband, which which is the personal part of this. This, There's this prophecy command to marry, uh, for Hosea to marry Gomer, 
Uh, then Gomer is likened to Israel in chapter 2. Uh, chapter 3, uh, God tells him to go restore her. The second part of the book takes on the, the national flavor, having, having had the object lesson in the first three chapters. Uh, the spiritual adultery of Israel, Israel's refusal to repent, uh, God's judgment, uh, and then restoration. So let's, uh, let's look at this a little more uh, in detail. The adulterous wife uh, and the faithful husband. Hosea marries Gomer. She bears him three children, uh, and God gives them the names of these children. Jezreel is the name of the first. God scatters. Lo Ruhama, not pitied or no mercy. And that's the word, that, that word ru, Ruhama is that word, we get the word womb in Hebrew from that. And then Loami. And Loami is not my people. And this, in this case, probably signifying that, that this child was not even Hosea's child a child Gomer had by another lover. And when you see these names, you see that, that God scattered the people, uh, that there was a season when, when they were not pitied, and there was a season when they carried on, and in all reality, had you been watching, you would have wondered, are, they, are these the people of God or not? One of the powerful pictures of love, we'll grant that 1 Corinthians 13 is one of the greatest descriptions of love, but one of the powerful pictures of love in the Bible is this, that, that uh, Gomer has run off and played the harlot. She's been used up and wasted as, as happens in that profession. And then God sends Hosea to buy her back from the slave market. She's, the picture here is that she's not even fit to be a harlot anymore. And he goes back and buys her back at a great price. And what a powerful picture of redemption that is, that Jesus Christ sheds his own blood, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And we see this uh, in an object lesson here. But then there's that second section, that adulterous Israel and, faith, and the faithful God. Hosea identifies. When God is telling him what to do, when God is telling him how, how God's people are acting toward him, Hosea not only sympathizes, but he, he empathizes that he feels the rejection because he's experienced it himself. Israel has plummeted into a terrible place, breaking the Ten Commandments uh, with impunity, hardening their hearts against God, ignoring the appeals coming from the prophets. And God finally indicts them. Look at Hosea 7, 1 with me and in Hosea 7, 13. When I would heal Israel, the iniquity of Ephraim is revealed and the evil deeds of Samaria, for they deal falsely. Their thief, the thief breaks in, the bandits raid outside. In other words, it's a culture of thievery, stealing, ill-gotten gain. Then verse 13, woe to them. For they've strayed from me, destruction to them, for they've rebelled against me. I would redeem them, but they speak lies to me. So just in these two verses, you see the, the, uh, the eighth commandment, you should not steal. Uh, the ninth commandment, you should not bear false witness, that, that they're, they're totally ignoring what they know is expected of them by God. And they rebel in arrogance and idolatry. So the warning comes. They sow the wind and they will reap the whirlwind. When, and the picture there, of course, is that when, you, when you're sowing seed to plant for harvest, if you sow in the wind, then you're going to reap the results of that. The whirlwind will be sure that you will come to naught. They will not repent. And God finally comes to the point where his judgment can be delayed no longer. He's holy, he's just, 
Chapters 4 through 7 speak of His holiness. Chapters 8 through 10 speak of His justice, but He's also loving and gracious, chapters 11 through 14. He must discipline to maintain His justice, but He will ultimately save and restore His people because He's a holy God. And then in Hebrews 11, Hosea 11, 8, pardon me. How can I give you up, O Ephraim? How can I hand you over, O Israel? How can I make you like Adma? How can I treat you like Zeboim? Adma and Zeboim, by the way, were two of the cities of the plains that were destroyed when Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed. And God is saying, I don't want to lay waste to you like I laid waste to the cities of the plains back in the days of Abraham and Lot. My heart recoils within me at, at, at the thought, that's the idea, that my compassion grows warm and tender. Then chapter 14, verse 4, God says, I will heal their apostasy. I will love them freely, for my anger is turned from them. The idea of loving freely, you see this word come up in, in Romans, justified freely. The idea behind it is not that there's no cost to it. The idea is that there's no there's no causative initiation. There's nothing, there's nothing in Israel to cause God to love them. He loves them freely, without cause, if you wanted to understand a better meaning of that. And so when Paul says in Romans that we've been justified freely, we're justified without any initiating cause in us, what God does for us in Christ. So he will love them uh, freely, for my anger has turned from them. As far as the title the name Hosea, and you, you'll recognize this when you think about it, uh, is a part of that word group like uh, Joshua. And Hosea, Hosea means salvation. Yehoshua, Joshua means God is my salvation. But Hosea is salvation. Jesus, we've told you, the Greek equivalent of that uh, means a Savior, Jesus. So his very name speaks of redemption. And he holds out the possibility of salvation, of redemption to the nation if they will repent and turn from their idolatry back to God. It's interesting, just as a side note, I came across this. Israel's last king is named Hosea. Uh, it's a very similar name as Hosea. Hardly anybody, and we've, we've looked at this through these, all these books we've studied, we've had, well, some scholars question the authorship of this, but hardly anybody questions Hosea as the author of this, of this prophecy. We don't know his place of birth, but he has a familiarity with the northern kingdom that would lead you to believe that he was, he was born and lived in Israel, the northern kingdom, not Judah, the southern kingdom. At one point in chapter 7, verse 5, he calls the king of Samaria our king, identifying himself with that area. We're told in chapter 1, verse 1, he's the son of Beeri, B-E-E-R-I. He's the husband of Gomer. He's the father of two sons and a daughter. We don't know anything else about him. He's, he, he's not mentioned elsewhere in the, in the Bible. One of those rare occasions where you don't have Hosea cited anywhere else. Like the God he represents, he has a real compassion for the people. And he suffers grievously uh, at the unfaithfulness of his wife. Even when he speaks of judgment, if you read through the prophecy, even when he speaks of judgment, it's, it's a tender, compassionate way that he says it. He does upbraid the people for their violation of the Ten Commandments but he also always interjects hope in that. We showed you in the brief graphic a while ago of, of when, it was, when it was written it's in the Northern Kingdom, written in that, that window uh, up to the early seven, 700s BC. When he, when he speaks of Ephraim, or, or you heard the fellow pronounce it Ephraim, the people pronounce it differently. 
that was the largest city in the northern kingdom. And so it would, it would be uh, like New York, New York City. You, kind of, you think of New York, you think of New York City. It was the largest city there, and it kind of represented the whole area, the largest tribe, really. He ministered during the reigns of these kings, Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah. Uh, these were kings of Judah. Uh, Jeroboam II, as was mentioned in the video, a very wicked king, was still reigning in Israel when, in the northern kingdom when, when Hosea undertook his prophetic ministry. He was a younger contemporary of Amos. We're going to see this Amos pretty soon. Hosea, Joel, Amos. We'll look at that in a couple of weeks. He was a contemporary of Isaiah and Micah who were in the southern kingdom. Uh, Amos being in the northern kingdom. His preaching and prophesying went after Jeroboam II, spanned the reigns of the last six kings of Israel from Zechariah to Hosea. The best uh, scholarship suggests that he compiled this book that we call the book of Hosea in the early years of, of Hezekiah. And his ministry stretched about 40 years, 35, 40 years. When he began his ministry, this is an interesting just context here. Israel was enjoying a, a temporary period of political and economic prosperity under Jeroboam II. But when Tiglath Pileser of the Assyrian dynasty stepped on the scene, uh, things turned very badly for Israel. Not only economically, not only politically, but also morally. And he begins to warn them that there will be consequences for turning their backs on God and embracing the foreign uh, deities. But it's like they were in a fog and so consumed with sin and idolatry that, that they, they didn't have ears to even try to hear what Hosea was saying. When you look at themes in this book, themes, uh, you break it down this way, really. In chapters 1 through 3, you have this movement, the adultery of Gomer, uh, which illustrates the sin of Israel. Uh, Gomer being degraded represents the judgment of Israel. And then Hosea's redemption of Gomer pictures the restoration of Israel. So you have that movement, the, the, the sin, the, the fallen consequences of that. And then the rescue. And we've told you as we've studied through the Old Testament, there's a cycle you can follow. And you can actually superimpose it on any culture. And it's pretty much the same. And it's been suggested by one writer I read that, that more than any other prophet, Hosea's personal experience reflects most accurately the prophetic message God had given him to deliver to the people of God. So, he not only preached it, he lived it personally. And in Gomer, you see, I mean, pardon me, in Hosea, you see this, this model of faithfulness, justice, love, forgiveness. He really is, in, in this book, a type of Christ. God's holiness contrasted with Israel's corruption comes through uh, throughout. Over 150 times in these 14 chapters, Hosea uh, denounces the sins. He gives statements about the sins of Israel. And more than half of those focus on idolatry. So you have these contrasting pictures, the theme of God's justice contrasted with Israel's lack of justice. The description earlier we read about them being thieves. 
I reminded you when we went through the study of the kings that there was never a good king in Israel. And so it's just, when, when that happens in succession, Paul talks about it in Romans, how you're storing up wrath against the day of wrath. God's love as a theme is seen in contrast to Israel's hardness of heart, and they're, they're simply going through the motions of religiosity. We see on, on display here God's, God's unconditional love, his, his loving kindness, his steadfast love, it's called. Through the prophet, God pleads with his people to return, but they will not. And so we look at keys to unlocking or understanding Hosea, you're looking at this, this key phrase is God's loyal love for Israel. The people of the northern kingdom are fickle. God is not fickle. Hosea, uh, the, the verses we read earlier, the key verses, I'll read them again to you. Chapter 4, verse 1. Chapter 11, verse 7 to 9. Hear the word of the Lord, O children of Israel, for the Lord has a controversy with the inhabitants of the land. There's no faithfulness or steadfast love and no knowledge of God in the land. That's quite a, quite a description of a people. No faithfulness, no steadfast love, no knowledge of God. And it was mentioned on the video, and the idea of knowledge of God. You remember, if you go back to the Genesis account, the word we spell K-N-O-W, uh, which is not that in Hebrew, obviously. We use it in a lot of different ways. But for God... That word meant intimate relationship. So we read in Genesis, and Adam knew his wife Eve, and she conceived. So obviously you recognize that that's a description of, of an intimate relationship that, that produces conception. So no knowledge of God. They have no real relationship with God. It reminds me of Matthew 7 toward the end of the Sermon on the Mount when Jesus said, Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, did we not do this? Did we not do that in your name? And I will say, depart from them. I, me, I never knew you. What's he talking about there? It's a Greek word, different word from the Hebrew, but the same idea. I, I never had a relationship with you. The only thing you had with me was in word only. It wasn't a personal relationship. And so in he, uh, Hosea 11, 7 to 9, my people are bent on turning away from me. And though they call out the Most High, get the picture here, their heart is bent away from him, but they go through the motions and with their mouth, this was the same thing in Isaiah, these people worship me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Though they call out to the Most High, he shall not raise them up at all. And then how can I give you up? There's this tender appeal of a, that you hear it in a, in a very husbandly tone to a wife. How can I give you up, O Ephraim? How can I hand you over, O Israel? How can I make you like Adma? How can I treat you like Zeboim? My heart recoils within me. My compassion grows warm and tender. I do not doubt that it's very similar to what Joseph experienced when he found out that Mary was with child. He was minded to put her away privily. In other words, his, his thinking was, I need to divorce her privately so as not to not bring public scorn upon her, but I need to cut off this betrothal that I have with her. The tearing that must have been going on with him. And then in verse 9, I will not execute my burning anger. I will not again destroy Ephraim, for I am God and not a man. In other words, I'm not like you. Hot, cold, hot, cold, hot, cold the Holy One in your midst, and I will not come in wrath. What a great comfort that would be. But you can understand when that's said to a hard-hearted people, how is that received? It, stokes, it can stoke presumption in their lives. Then the key chapter in the, in the book is chapter 4. Uh, and uh, they've turned away from the truth and followed pagan ways. In Hosea 4, 6, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Now you typically hear that quoted, if you've heard it before, from someone who says that, that there's, there's not good teaching in the pulpit or in the church today. 
Well, there's a truth in that, but that's not what this is talking about. Hosea is faithfully bringing the word to them. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because you have rejected knowledge. Because you've done that, I reject you from being a priest to me. Okay? And since you have forgotten the law of your God, I also will forget your children. It's consequences. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. John's gospel. He who has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And so there's a tension here. We, one of the hymns we sing is trust and obey. And there's an order there. It's trust first, faith first. But obey is the fruit of trust. And so therefore, habitual disobedience is the evidence of an absence of trust. So now, so where do we see Jesus in Hosea? Well, I've already suggested that Hosea is a type of Christ. Jesus loves us the way Hosea loved Gomer. When we're unfaithful, Jesus does not go, wash my hands of you. I've had enough. I don't deserve this. I've given you way too many chances. No, he loves us. He loves us with an everlasting love. He loves us. He draws us with, with these cords of love. So you see him in that. It's interesting, uh, in, in chapter 11, uh, verse 1, when Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son, is, is said in, in Hosea's prophecy. It's interesting what happens in Matthew's gospel with that. Look at Matthew 2, 14 and 15. Matthew says, and he rose, that is, Joseph rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt. Remember, Herod was threatening to kill all children two years of age and less to wipe out any possibility that a male child born within that time frame would survive and rise to be a king and challenge him. And so he remained in Egypt there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet out of Egypt, I called my son. The book of Hosea cites this or expresses this as a, it's a, it becomes in the, in the Gospel of Matthew, very obviously for us, a messianic anticipation. God calls the Messiah to come back out of Egypt. And historically, both Israel and Christ left Palestine to take refuge in Egypt. So Christ is very obvious in Hosea. If you want to understand from a human perspective how God, how Christ loves us, read the book of Hosea. See how Hosea loved Gomer. Stare into her life and ask and be sure, Lord, I don't want to be like that. But what about the contribution? Uh, oh, by the way, one more thing. The picture of buying her out of the slave market the language in the New Testament for redemption, uh, uh, ex agarazzo, uh, some of the other, the other terms that are used, means to purchase out of the slave market. Those are the language, that's the language used to discuss redemption in the New Testament, that we're bought as slaves. That's what Jesus does in saving us. So what about the contribution to the Bible? He's, Hosea is the first of the 12 minor prophets. Uh, the largest one. And the New Testament quotes or alludes to some of the statements in Hosea several times. And I want us to, we're going to close looking at these so, so you can get your Bible out you, or you can mark something down. We want to show you. Hosea 1.10, for example. Yet the number of the children of Israel shall be like the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured or, or numbered. It sounds very much like the promise God made to Abraham. And in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people, it shall be said to them, children of the living God. That's the promise of God. In Romans 9, 25 to 27, as indeed he says in Hosea, those who were not my people, I will call my people. And her who was not beloved, I will call beloved. And in the very place where he, it was said to them, you're not my people, they will be called sons of the living God. 
And Isaiah cries out concerning Israel, though the number of the sons of Israel be as the sand of the sea, only a remnant of them will be saved. If you recognize where that is in Romans, it's in chapter 9, where Paul is discussing God's special uh, place for his people. And Paul cites that. 2 Corinthians 6, 18. I will be a father to you, and you shall be my be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. So there's this, this very tender language in Hosea finds its way in the New Testament. And then uh, from Hosea 2, 23. I will sow her for myself in the land. I will have mercy on no mercy. Remember the name of the, of, of the child that meant no mercy? And I will say to not my people, Loami, you are my people. And he shall say, you are my God. And so the, this, this language of hope and promise that is coming. And again, in Romans, uh, we, just, we just read it, chapter 9, verse 25 and 26. I would simply just commend it to you again. And look at 1 Peter 2, 10. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. A very direct parallel to God's dealings with Israel and the picture that becomes to us for God's love toward us in Christ. Then in Hosea 6, 6, God says to the prophet, I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice, the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. This idea that their, their practice of religious worship was empty because it did not flow out of a heart of steadfast love for him. It did not come out of a heart that had an intimate knowledge of him, a personal knowledge of him. And so in Matthew 9, 13, we read this. Go and learn what this means, Jesus said. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. So Jesus cites this as a way to give an exhortation of his coming, his ministry. Matthew 12, 7. If you'd known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. Jesus challenging them with their accusations of him for healing. Then Hosea 10, 8. The high places of Avon, the sin of Israel, shall be destroyed. Thorn and thistle shall grow up on their altars, and they shall say to the mountains, cover us, and to the hills, fall on us. In other words, their consequences for pursuing a life of idolatry. And the day will come when you face God and you will cry out, as this says, cover us. The hills fall on us. Now think about that. You know, you know a passage we've cited several times throughout the years in Revelation. But before we get there, look at Luke 23, 30. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, fall on us, to the hills cover us. Jesus is talking about the last time. It's what it's going to be like then. And then Revelation 6, 16 calling to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne. And this, this juxtaposition of these next terms is astonishing to me. And from the wrath of the Lamb. That a continual refusal to submit to God will result in a fierce, fiery judgment that will be terrifying beyond words. In Hebrews, um, Hebrews, Hosea 11.1, 1, when Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. Matthew 2.14 uh, and 15, and he rose and took the child. We've already cited this, but I want you to just see this again. And remained in Egypt until the death of Herod, so to fulfill what the Lord has spoken by the prophet Hosea, out of Egypt, I called my son. Then Hosea 13.14, we're just about finished here. I shall ransom them from the power of Sheol. I shall redeem them from death. O death, where are your plagues? O Sheol, where is your sting? Compassion is hidden from my eyes when it comes to defeating the enemies of God. And of course, you know where that, where that shows up in the New Testament. 1 Corinthians 15, 55, where Paul is launched into that, those, those closing verses there that we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment of the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. The trumpet shall sound, the dead in Christ will rise first. And he goes on and talks about this corruptible body taking on incorruption. And then he then will be brought to pass the saying that is written, he says, that death is swallowed up in victory. And then he mocks death. Oh, 
death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? Right out of Hosea. And then Hosea 14, 2. Take with you words and return to the Lord. Say to him, take away all iniquity, accept what is good. We will pay with the bulls the vows of our lips. The exhortation from the prophet, go back to the Lord with words. Repent. Promise fruit of your repentance. Hebrews 13, 15, through him, then let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. So you see these, these allusions, some quotations, some allusions where the, where the writers of the New Testament are using things taught in the prophecy of Hosea. Uh, it has a very prominent place in citation, though we know nothing, virtually nothing of Hosea, and he himself is not, not cited. Well, there are different, we're going to wrap it up with this, different views concerning Hosea's marriage to Gomer. Uh, some would say that this is a fictional allegory of God and Israel. I was taught that in seminary, by the way, sadly. But there's not much basis for that position. When you read chapters 1 to 3, there's a, there's a straightforward narrative there. I mean, it's, it's clearly speaking of, of history, something that happened historically. No indications it's fictitious. Uh, and as I said earlier, although in chapter 1, verse 2, he's told to take a wife of harlotry, it doesn't necessarily mean that she was a harlot before he married her. Although we need to leave open the, the window that she could have been. I mean, we were not faithful. Sinners are not faithful. Sinners are, sinners are pursuing many gods before the Lord captures us by grace and draws us. So I think we need to leave out the possibility that, go, that Hosea was told to go marry a woman who was actively a harlot at the time, which would have been inexplicable and unthinkable, except that God was in it to show and demonstrate his powerful mercy and love and forgiveness and use it as an object lesson to teach us of how he loves us. Okay, questions or comments about the book of Hosea.